Welcome to session six of our study of 1 Samuel. We are in chapter eight, and 1 Samuel chapter eight is, for me, one of the most personally meaningful chapters in the entire Bible. I don't expect that by the end of this, it will necessarily be the same for you, but I would love to share a bit of my own reading of this text and how it's emerged at different points in my journey as an important one in God's guidance in my life. I think we probably all, if we've been following Jesus for very long, can speak of maybe a couple of occasions where we had distinct experiences with the Lord through his word. And that's not to discount all of the times when we read it and don't experience anything out of the ordinary or all of the times when we go to church and we we hear the word preached. I have a, I have a deep conviction that anytime you hear the words of scripture read aloud, this is the voice of the Lord speaking to us. But in many times, in many cases, there are those times when something opens up for us and, and through our engagement of the word, God does something in our lives. And I can think back to probably my first notable experience with the word. Uh, the second one would have come from me in college and it was from Philippians chapter three in this desire to know Christ above all. But the first one happened probably when I was about 16 or 17 years old in the middle of high school. And I was growing up and becoming a young man. And I was also kind of trying to figure out my relationship with the Lord. And it was a really important season for me when I made some decisions that really continued to shape me years after. And now, of course, I look back and realize that I felt like I was the one making the decisions, but really the Lord was carrying me along in important ways. Anyway, long story short, I remember one night in high school, I got up in the middle of the night and I couldn't sleep. And I had a lot of physical pain in my body at the time, and I didn't really know what was going on, but I didn't know what to do other than just to get down on my knees and to read the Bible and to pray. And so I did. I got down on my knees before the Lord, and it wasn't something I normally did very often, but I just opened up the Bible, and I can't even remember why I ended up in 1 Samuel 8, but I ended up in 1 Samuel 8, and I had, again, one of the more profound experiences of the Lord's presence, the Lord communicating important things to me that continues to shape me to this day. So enough of my story. I'd like to read the text with you, 1 Samuel 8 and we'll see what the Lord says to us on this particular occasion. Here's what we read in this chapter. It says, When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. Interesting to us at this point that Samuel has two sons, much like his mentor Eli had two sons. Things didn't work out too well for Eli's sons, and so narratively we're left to wonder, what about Samuel's? But his sons did not follow in his ways. There's our answer. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted, perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the Lord, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and, and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then will we be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. When Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. And Samuel said to the Israelites, everyone go back to your own town. This is 1 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, the story is not too hard to follow. Samuel is getting along in years and his sons are not following in his footsteps. So the people may regard him as a worthy leader, but clearly he has not been able to train up his sons in the way that he himself is going. And so they're wondering about a new situation. 
They come to him and they make a request for a king. They're nervous, they're insecure. They're not confident that the form of leadership that has gotten them to this point is going to move them forward. And so they ask for a king, but they don't just ask for a king. They ask for a king with a specific motivation attached. They want a king like all the other nations. They want a king such as all the other peoples. They want a king like those who have somebody to lead them into battles, somebody who oversees the whole of their territory and is the unquestioned leader of all. This is interesting when you think about their neighbors. It's not like there was a bunch of other forms of God's people around them. They're essentially asking if they can have a king just like all the Philistines have because they're not sure they'll be safe unless they can have one. Samuel, of course, initially takes this personally. This seems like an affront to his own leadership, and he's a little miffed by this, and so he goes to the Lord, and the Lord says to him, don't make this about you. This is not about you. This is about me. This has been what has been happening since I delivered them from slavery. They have continued to turn away from me, and now you're experiencing a taste of what I've known since I called these people to be my own. And so God says to him, I want you to go ahead and give them what they're asking for, but tell them what they can expect. And so Samuel does this. He, he clarifies, and you probably noticed the uh, references to the word take and to the word his, that he will take the things that belong to you and make them his own. And, and this is what will happen. But the people refuse to listen. That's a key phrase here. Because those who hear the word can see the, see the world clearly, but those who reject the word cannot. And so that's what's happening. As is so often in this book, the people refuse to listen. No, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to fight our battles. And so the Lord once more says, listen to them and give them a king. Uh, let's, uh, let's break our reflections on this text down into two basic categories. The first category I'm actually going to move uh, somewhat briefly through, and that is what this text tells us about God. I want to mention four things. And then really what I want to do is to key in for a bit on what this text actually tells us about sin. And again, four things. So fairly briefly, I think there are a few things that we see about God from 1 Samuel chapter 8. One thing that we see is that God plans good things for those who trust and wait. You know, I've really wrestled, uh, as will have any of you who have studied this passage, really wrestled with what sense to make of their request for a king. Like, was this necessarily a bad thing in its own right? Was it wrong to ask for a king? Or was it fine to ask for a king, but just not this kind of ask? And there's some debates in scholarship about the nature of what's going on here, but most voices would suggest those that take the scripture as coherent. Actually, when you read 1 Samuel, there are a number of scholars who say, clearly you have one source that likes the kingship and another source that doesn't, and the editors just thrown them together in sloppy fashion. That doesn't at all seem to me to be what's going on here. What seems to happen is that you have a text that is honest, and so it provides varying perspectives, even as it wrestles aloud with the nature of human leadership and invites us to wrestle along. So anyway, most scholars who take this as coherent would suggest that the problem was not that they wanted a king. They would suggest that God always actually intended to provide a king for his people. You can find in numerous places up to this point in the story of scripture, references to a king. In Genesis chapter 17, God comes to Abraham and says, I, you know, I confirm my promise to you that you will be a great nation. And he actually says there, uh, right around the time he's calling for circumcision to, to signify the covenant, he says to him, from, from you, kings will come. And so there's this prophecy early on that kings will come from, from Abraham's uh, line of descendants. Then you move forward and in Numbers chapter 24, you actually have uh, Balaam, the, the prophet who can't help but prophesy the things that God wants to be prophesied. Um, he doesn't speak against Israel, even though this other king wants him to. And, uh, and actually in the course of prophesying about Israel, he mentions again that they will have a king that will be greater than the other king, greater than Agag. And so here you have another prophecy about Israel having a king. Even in, um, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, Moses is giving the people the law and he says, um, you know, when you move into the land and you'll ask for a king like all the other nations and here are the regulations for the kingship. So it's not entirely clear here whether this means this is a good thing or this is a bad thing, but I'm going to regulate it. At any rate, it was something that God knew was coming. And maybe most importantly, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, when Hannah was praising God for the things that he had done in giving her Samuel, she actually said that, uh, that, that the Lord will provide a king to lead his people. And so it doesn't seem like this is the wrong request. It seems like it's done in the wrong way. And part of what's done in the wrong way is that there's not a trusting of God's timing for this. There is a desire to, to uh, be like those around them and to, to have what we want and to have it right now. Even when Samuel comes back and says, this is the bad things that are going to happen, they say, no, we want, we want this king right now. We actually learn later on in the story that there was an Ammonite king who was coming against them, and that provided the context for them to ask for this. And so what we learn is that God plans good things for those who trust and wait 
Um, and we learn this negatively here in this case. A second thing that we see is that God doesn't run the world the way we would if we were God. This has been an important truth that emerges from many stories in 1 Samuel, and so we're just choosing this particular point to make it. We could have made this point back in chapter 1. Uh, God's going to give us this story about moving from a tribal confederacy to a, a, a royal monarchy, and yet it begins with this woman, Hannah, who can't give birth to a child, and this is how the story moves forward, and the answer is yes, God's sovereignty looks different. And we might think that it's a terrible idea to try to govern a people by not having one appointed leader over them by just suggesting that God actually means to work through local leaders and that he'll raise up uh, particular leaders for particular needs as the people cry out. And so God doesn't run the world the way we would run the world if we were him. We would certainly fight like those around us. And God says, well, I'm king and you're not. Um, but we ask for one. And so we see, this is the third thing, that God tests us to strengthen us, but accommodates our weakness. We'll come back to portions of this as we proceed throughout the, the book. But Let's notice that last part, God accommodates our weakness. This is an important thing to keep in mind when you're reading the Old Testament, that many times, um, if you were to try, you know, you wanna think ethically about how to make sense of what's going on here, and those are perfectly legitimate questions, this is the word of God. We have to keep in mind that we're dealing with, from this point forward, um, a situation that's not what God wants. God wanted to be Israel's king, and Israel demanded her own human king, and so from this point forward in the story, we're not looking at God's ideal for the situation. Of course, this is a picture of how God works with the world as a whole, that he accommodates our weakness and works from within to bring about redemption. This is why we see some of the brokenness and sin that we see. And then the last thing that we see here in 1 Samuel 8 about God is that God gives us fair warning, but he lets us go our way. Samuel comes to the people of Israel and says very clearly, if you make him king, he will take, 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 and he will take what is yours and make it his, 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 his. This is a clear word here. If you have a king that you're asking for that God doesn't want you to have, it's not going to go well for you. And yet the people say, no, this is what we want to do. And gosh, you think about him, some of Jesus' calls to his disciples, you think about the rich young ruler. I continue to come back to that story when I look at the demands for obedience in 1 Samuel. And, and you notice that Jesus is essentially giving him an opportunity to sell everything that you have and, and come and, and find real wealth, find, find real provision. And he walks away. And at least in Mark's gospel, this is the only time when Jesus is said to love a particular character. And Jesus' love is demonstrated in calling him, calling him to give up everything, but then letting him walk away when he doesn't. This is a, a scary truth that God gives us fair warning, but lets us go our way. Sometimes you wonder why things aren't going better for the church or for a particular culture. And I wonder if sometimes the answers are right here, but we're not paying attention to them. And God is giving us what we're asking for. At any rate, my intent was to work through those things fairly quickly. Those are four things about God. Let's, um, let's continue thinking through this particular passage and ask, what do we learn about sin here? Because there's some fascinating dynamics. And my suggestion to you is that it would be beneficial to read this story in 1 Samuel 8 alongside another story, that is Genesis chapter 3, and Adam and Eve together in the garden being told by God, you can eat fruit from any of the trees except not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That one I want you to stay away from. And then they see this, and Eve in particular is said to see this fruit, and it's pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom. And so she reaches out, and her husband, who was with her but wasn't saying anything, reaches out, and, and they eat this fruit, and then they experience the immediate ramifications of this. So what similarities might we might find between these two stories that certainly then would help us understand some of our own tendencies? I think we learned four things about sin. Number one is we learned that it is driven by fear, but a very specific kind of fear. Uh, our sin is driven by a fear that God cannot be trusted to secure our good. I think that sin always begins here with the temptation to wonder if maybe God is holding out on us. You can, of course, see how that plays out in Genesis chapter 3. The voice of the serpent comes to Eve and says, did God really say that you would die? Or is it that God actually doesn't want you to have his same benefits and prerogatives? Are you sure that you can trust him? That's the question. Are you sure that you can trust him to secure your lasting good? And that is, of course, what's going on here. The people are experiencing real insecurity. Let's not be harsh on them. To live in a world where most people groups are led by a human king that rallies the troops and organizes the bureaucracy and leads them in battle? Who wouldn't want that? Like, these are real threats. Moving from a being a tribal confederacy in a context where everybody else is a centralized monarchy would bring deep stress indeed. And so, same situation. Do you trust in the moments where it is very difficult to believe 
where it is very difficult to think that God's way of doing things is the best way of doing things. Where are you going to go with that? And we do well to remember that this is where sin begins. It's, it begins with and is driven by this fear that God cannot be trusted to ensure our good. And maybe secondly, building on that, we would say that, you know, it's fed by another fact, FOMO, I guess. It's fed by a, a fear that looks around us and wants what other people have. It's not just a vertical thing. It's also this horizontal thing. How, I'm afraid that God won't provide for me. And when I look at what other people have that I don't because I'm following God, I don't like the comparison. It feels like I am missing out on something that they can have. And again, Genesis 3, it was desirable. It looked tasty and it seemed like it was going to be good to make me wise, which is what I want to be. And so I'm going to reach out and grab it. And, and the people are saying, look, man, they have safety and they have a person up top. And that's just what we want, Samuel. No offense, but you're old. That's how their speech begins. You're old, buddy. And like the people coming after you aren't going to cut it anymore. And so we need a new system. We need a new system that looks like their system because they seem secure. And so our sin is driven by the fear that God can't be trusted and it's fed. It's fed by this fear that other people have something better than what we have when we obey God. And the third thing, we notice that it's characterized by impatience, that there's a grasping, a grasping right now of what God intends to provide for us in his own time and in his own way. There's a refusal to wait for the gift. I very much think that, um, well, it seems like that's some of what's going on here. Once again, if if we're reading it properly, that the problem is not that they wanted a king, but it's they, that they demanded one right now, just like everybody else. No, it seemed that God wanted to guide them to a point where he could provide the king he wanted to be on the throne. That seems to be the best way to pull together the biblical evidence. And they said, no, today, right now, this is what we want. I think that's an important thing to think about with Genesis 3 as well. The desire for the knowledge of good and evil is not a bad thing. I mean, that's just a biblical term for wisdom. The knowledge of good and evil is being able to discern right and wrong. The problem wasn't what they wanted. It's that they wanted it right now in a certain way. We don't want to trust God to give us wisdom over time. We want to reach out and grasp it for ourselves. And so often, the call to obedience is a call to wait and to put our hope and put our trust in the Lord. And those things are uncomfortable when you're in the middle of the season where you're just waiting and you just want to see the fruits of your obedience right now, that's a temptation. And then the fourth thing I think we notice, and this is very scary for me, and I think properly shows so should be scary for all of us, is that the sin that we see here manifested is deepened by our tendency to trust our gut over God's word. Oh man, it's probably not too hard to see that today, to see that in yourself and to see that in certain aspects of our culture. How can you tell me that these natural desires that I feel are wrong? How can you tell me that I need to rethink the core of who I am? How can you tell me? How can you tell me? How can you tell me when I just know, when I just know, when I just know? And that's what's going on here is we're essentially saying that my gut, my unsanctified desires are a reliable guide to good action in the world. Now, we don't believe that on paper as believers in Jesus, but it's hard because we trust our gut. That's what happened in Genesis 3. They trusted their gut. Man, this just looks so good. I think probably God is holding out. I'm going to go with my gut. That's what happens in 1 Samuel 8. You have this clear prophetic word from Samuel. No, no, it's a bad idea, people. Terrible idea. Take it from me. You can trust me. I've been bringing you the word since I was a boy. And they say, appreciate the word, Samuel, but we're going to go ahead and solidify our request and ask for a king. Man, what a story. What a terrible, terrible story. And yet we find ourselves in it. That was the experience for me as a 16-year-old. I asked was reading this passage over and over and, and, and you know, it's, it's like most who are starting to take their faith seriously. I so badly wanted God to talk to me all the time and, and I felt like he did in that moment. He said, it was just like this thought, not an audible word, but a thought came into my mind and it was a question, will you let me be your king? And I remember thinking, yes, this is awesome, God. I always wanted to talk to you. What else you got for me? And he said again, will you let me be your king? And it was almost comical. It was like over and over. I got that one, I got that one down. Like, yeah, again, maybe you didn't hear me. Yes, my answer is yes to that. What else do you want to say to me? But over and over and over, I got the same question. Will you let me be your king? Will you let me be your king? Will you let me be your king? And if I may, not to prevail upon the word of God or to provoke him as if I could somehow improve upon that question, but maybe, maybe after 20 plus years, of my own experience with this text, we could add some texture to that particular question that's so central. Will you crucify your natural desires in joyful submission to God's intrusive word? Will you wait on the Lord's timing 
to reward obedience in his time and ways, to provide what you need according to his set schedule, not your own? Will you resist the subtle seduction of the spirit of our age? Whatever that may look like for you in your own personal, familial, and cultural context, will you not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your thought process? Of course, at heart, will you trust God's willingness and ability to ensure your good? Will you believe that God can be trusted even when he makes no sense? Perhaps it really is just about this one question. Will we let God be our King? <laughs>